Hey, welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today, we're joined by Natalie Smolensky, founder and executive director at the new Texas Bitcoin Foundation, foundation which just launched last week in Austin, Texas. The TBF is working on a host of educational and research initiatives focused around Bitcoin, property rights, and socioeconomic development. Natalie talks about the foundation's plans and how Texas is becoming a hot seat for Bitcoin advocacy. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. We'll just jump right into it. Natalie, thank you so much yeah. for coming on, coming on the Compass podcast. Uh, interesting developments in Texas, as yes. always, with Bitcoin. So let's we'll just start off Texas Bitcoin Foundation, the who, what, where, why, when, all that good stuff. What's going on down south in Austin? Yeah. So um, the Texas Bitcoin Foundation is a new 501c3 um, that was formed to uh, promote research and education about Bitcoin. So right now we're, you know, in the kind of elbow of the mass adoption curve of Bitcoin. Um, and we're seeing a new crop of policy oriented organizations um, crop up. So uh, the Texas Blockchain Council, which uh, is a 501c6 trade association, um, is an example of that. Uh, I'm chairman of the board of that organization. Uh, but there was a real need um, for us to also zoom out and take a 30,000 foot view of why Bitcoin matters um, for the future of governance in the 21st century. So right now we're kind of at this historical crossroads where um, on the one hand, you know, we're seeing the, the global uh, petrodollar reserve system uh, start you know, on the slope of decline. Um, we're seeing cracks in the Enlightenment era institutions of democratic governance um, that we've established. So, you know, if if you recall in, in 1992, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, when Francis Fukuyama published The End of History, there was kind of this assumption that, you know, guys, we did it. Mission accomplished, you know, liberal democracy, free markets. This is the ideology that has won the day and we're, we're kind of done. Um, <clears throat> that is clearly no longer the case. Um, so we've now seen that capitalism uh, and democracy don't necessarily have to go hand in hand. Um, you know, there's an open question as to how free uh, American markets are. Um, we've, you know, seen increasing, uh, just normalization of state surveillance, whether it's a financial transactions or movement, um, or, you know, any type of activity, um, digitally or in the analog world. Um, and so, you know, we're encountering these unprecedented challenges to our inherited systems, uh, of government. And in order to address those challenges, policy itself isn't enough. Like policy is very important, but when we're talking policy, we're talking tactics. Um, tactics need to come from a strategy and a strategy needs to be informed by ideas. So who are we? What do we value? What type of society do we want to become? And this is why the Texas Bitcoin Foundation is a 501c3. Uh, so we're actually a public charity. Uh, that also means donations are tax deductible because we're really trying to do the intellectual work, the academic work that underpins whatever policy initiatives come down the road. Definitely. You guys have a pretty big charter ahead of you, but you also know how to throw a good party. So great job on the launch last <laughs> week in Austin. That was a lot Thank of fun. Uh, too many drinks probably. But let's read from your press release really quickly because I think it was a good summary of what you guys are trying to do with the Texas Bitcoin Foundation. You say, quote, the global adoption of Nakamoto consensus or proof of work has profound implications for the future of capitalism, the nation state, democratic governance, next generation energy generation and distribution, financial inclusion, and many other social issues in order to ensure that a response to Bitcoin as a society generates human flourishing. These larger questions must be addressed in a rigorous and scientific way. So that's a lot of words, a lot of yeah. words with multiple parts to them. Let's unpack that a little bit in this yeah. conversation. The scope of what you guys are doing is definitely bigger than just Texas, but yeah. you've chosen to stay put in Texas. Can you tell me why you're, you're choosing Austin and why you're choosing Texas as the bastion for this 
very Bitcoin centric, but also I would say almost classical, classically liberal uh, political movement. You know, any any movement, any disruptive innovation always starts local. Um, so, you know, I, I'm actually a software executive by day. And um, in the SaaS world, we like to talk about, you know, land and expand. So if you're a startup, first thing you do is you find your niche, you know, your, your small community of target customers. And then once you, you know, absolutely crush it there, uh, you begin to expand out to adjacencies and, and to other markets. Um, it's the same thing with political theory uh, and political philosophy. So Austin is emerging as kind of an epicenter for, I would say, a revival of classical liberal thought. Um, and that type of thinking, you know, because it is so universal, um, it encompasses people from the left, the right, the center, you know, from many different political orientations who are coming together to ask the question of what, uh, freedom means, you know, what liberty means, uh, what the optimal relations between state and society should look like and between individual and society. And so in Austin, you know, we have these emerging movements like uh, the University of Austin, the Cicero Institute, um, you know, obviously the Texas Blockchain Council. Um, and it's that scene, that cultural ferment that creates the dynamism that then enables these ideas to have impact beyond uh, Texas. You guys have a pretty star-studded cast to fit it as well. So yourself as founder and executive director, Lee Bratcher, Tour Demeester, Avic Roy, Dan Hughes, Joseph Kelly. I'm sure there's a few other names that I haven't mentioned or don't know about entirely. Can you tell me about this group? Because Tour Demeester, I, I've known him for years, just more as a trader and a macro thinker and a blogger, uh, has some very interesting insights. I know he's basically Austin-based. I've come to know, know Avic Roy's work this year, then Lee Bratcher as well, obviously with Texas Blockchain Council's pretty well-known Encompass circles. Uh, but can you tell me a little bit more about this group in particular? Yeah. Um, so we have a fantastic founding board. And when I was thinking about building this board, I had a couple of uh, criteria in mind. One is that I wanted everyone to be based in Texas, uh, at least initially. Uh, because you know of that land and expand uh, strategy that I was talking about earlier, um, you know every movement needs a power base, um, and Texas is really shaping up as a power base for uh, the global Bitcoin community. Um, so everyone's based in Texas. Um, I also wanted you know people who have uh, institutional pedigree and reputation in the Bitcoin space. Um, so people who are recognized as you know, real leaders and who have done a lot of work to move adoption forward. So whether that's you know, Joe Kelly, CEO of Unchained Capital, you know, probably the, the flagship um, Bitcoin-based financial services company in Texas, um, or you know, Ovik Roy, who is the founder of uh, FreeOp, a think tank that focuses on market-based solutions to uh, income inequality. Um, I also was looking for people who have, you know, more of an academic or social scientific uh, bent to their work, because um, this is really, you know, supposed to be an incubator, this foundation for political theory. And so, you know, someone like Tour has has been writing um, about political economy for for years and years, and is is one of the leading social theorists of Bitcoin. Um, you know, Dan Hughes, um, who uh, is a founder, serial entrepreneur, um, is also a philosopher uh, specializing in political economy um, and phenomenology. Uh, so we, you know, and then myself, you know, I'm actually an anthropologist uh, and historian by background. So we have this wonderful combination of uh, academic expertise with uh, commercial and entrepreneurial expertise. I mean, you look, you look at everyone's titles and it's like, Founder, 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 um, <laughs> and then we also have people with you know world class policy expertise who who understand how to connect ideas to policy. Totally, yeah. Seeing a tour on the board and along with others, 
definitely kind of shows up what kind of punching power you guys have. So let's dive into it a little bit more specifically. So I think we've kind of covered the the when and the where and the who. Let's talk about the what. So education and research, and you kind of hat tip to, to it right there. You guys want to really dive into political philosophy and political philosophy research which is definitely not what a lot of other people are doing in the Bitcoin space. We see open grants initiatives through BitMEX uh, and others giving funds to Bitcoin core developers so they can go build out new uh, cryptographic libraries or they can build new wallets or uh, even BIPs. That doesn't seem to be what you guys are doing here. You guys are funding research and education initiatives around political science. Who is that directed for? Maybe you can give me a little bit more information on the practicalities of that. Yes. Um, so I'll start out by saying that one of our initiatives is also to, to fund uh, development of the Bitcoin uh, open source ecosystem. But to your point, you know, we're, we're not the only organization that does that. I'm kind of of the point of view that the more the merrier, you know, the more funding we can get for this, the better. Um, but our real differentiator is precisely on that political theory, um, social science side. And so one of our first projects is something called the Satoshi Papers, which is a compilation of essays kind of modeled on um, the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers, which you know were the, uh, the founding kind of political theory of the American Republic. So that debate about what a confederation of states looks like, um, what is the optimal you know, relationship between the states and why are we coming together at all? Like, what's what's the overarching purpose? Um, my point of view is that we we need to reopen that debate. Um, we're we're at an era of unprecedented political polarization. Um, you know, I, I think the the sense is growing uh, among the American public that the current party system isn't really serving us uh, as a country, um, and and new questions are emerging about the role of the states versus the role of the federal government. And so then enter Bitcoin, (laughs) a a stateless, self-sovereign currency uh, that's not controlled by the Federal Reserve um, or, you know, BIS or any coalition of central banks. And so how does that uh, social technology impact the trajectory of of the evolution of the American state? Um, And so... The Satoshi Papers is really kind of our first project. Um, we're going to be putting out a call for papers soon. Anybody can submit an abstract. Um, but the type of work we have in mind is like similar to the work that's being done by like the Resistance Money Collective, for example, um, where it's a group of scholars coming together to, to really ask the question of what Bitcoin means for American society. Okay, so much more broad struck in that approach. I kind of want to zero in on what you're saying there, though, about how the American state system isn't quite working how it used to be. And at least that's the way I'm kind of understanding mm-hmm. your statement and wondering how you see Bitcoin stepping into that role, uh, because it, it's a very common sentiment, I feel like, in Texas at the very least, but in yeah. other more right leaning states that it's not working, that the, the current ways that the states and the federal government and others interact is not working. How do you see Bitcoin kind of fixing that? And how does the foundation step into that role? I think one of the ways that Bitcoin um, intervenes politically is that um, it creates an imperative around uh, property ownership, which is, I mean, if, if you look at the history of liberal political theory, you know, ownership of property is really there at the very beginning of uh, theories of individual rights. Um, and, and that, you know, when we think about the purpose of the rule of law, you know, often, you know, the bare bones function of the state is to protect property rights, to enforce contracts, um, and to ensure that, you know, uh, crimes are, are punished. I mean, and to provide for the common defense. So if you think about like just the bare bone functions of the state, um, you want to generally live in a state that um, protects protects your property. Um, there's you know there's been a long debate about what that means in practice, um, and reasonable people, of course, can can disagree. Um, but fundamentally, what Bitcoin kind of forces is that issue: is that there is a um, uh, a sovereign store of value that is not confiscatable by the state. 
Um, so in, increasingly, I mean, what, what we've seen is, you know, when you establish a third party as a protector of something over time, it can actually become the, the sort of controller of something or the, the permission, the gatekeeper to something. Um, and so, you know, should people be able to be alienated from their own property? I mean, this is, this is a question that a Bitcoin firmly answers in the negative. Um, and that, that in itself has repercussions. Um, I mean, it has repercussions for um, the, you know, the banking system as a disciplinary arm of the state. It has repercussions, you know, for eminent domain. It has repercussions for trusts. It has repercussions for, you know, the entire legal structure of ownership uh, in our society. And, and so that, you know, we should think about that. Like it, it, talking about alienability or, or inalienability of rights um, has often been a kind of intellectual exercise dependent on the goodwill or the good faith of the state um, or, you know, of society to, to honor it. But when you have a right encoded at the protocol level, you know, what does that change? That's the open question. On a political level, what does that look like for you guys interacting with Texas? Because my understanding is you guys aren't lobbying. You guys aren't really interested in any sort of lobbying efforts. Uh, I know you guys work closely with the Texas Blockchain Council in, in some regards. So maybe kind of mm -hmm. defining those relationships would be interesting because the organization from this conversation does seem necessarily very political in nature. But you guys aren't really interested in, in lobbying. You guys are interested in research and more or less like thought leadership, I'd suppose. That's right. Um, so we're, we're kind of the brain trust for, um, you know, political theory and social theory in, in the Bitcoin ecosystem. That's, that's how I see us adding value. Um, in terms of like advocating or formulating and advocating for policy, that's really the job of trade associations, uh, 501c6 organizations like the Texas Blockchain Council. Um, or SAT Center, you know, or some of these other organizations that are emerging at the national level. Um, so, you know, the Texas Blockchain Council would be the organization that would propose things like a strategic Bitcoin reserve for the state of Texas. Um, they would do that, though, by drawing upon the work of the foundation um, that makes it clear, you know, why something like a strategic Bitcoin reserve might be necessary for a state to pursue. And so the relationship is complementary, but necessarily different. Okay. No, that's good clarification. And just to add a little bit more color on top of this. So the education initiatives seem to be pretty high level. Like if you're, if you're talking about, if you're, if you're pulling out the road, like uh, classically liberal, then you've probably lost like 85% of your audience. So I'm wondering like, <laughs> who are you trying to target for your audience specifically? Is it lawmakers? You can send them very detailed, highly published, peer-reviewed notes of whatever you guys are publishing. Or is it for founders? Is it for people in the tech space? Is it people to launch similar initiatives in other states? You're trying to encourage this kind of high-level thinking. Who's who's the audience for the content you guys are going to create? Yeah, so um, our audience is anyone who is interested in thinking rigorously about Bitcoin. So that could be uh, scholars uh, and academics, social scientists, computer scientists, uh, political theorists, philosophers. Um, it could also be public intellectuals, you know, people who may not have a scholarly pedigree, but who are out there in the public sphere, you know, talking about Bitcoin as a social in innovation. Um, we also, you know, want to reach uh, ordinary people who, who are, you know, th they're looking for uh, a more precise analysis of how the world around them is changing. Um, there's a lot of intellectual curiosity in the Bitcoin community. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, even when I say, you know, things like classically liberal, I mean, that's, that's, that's sort of um, maybe a close term, but the reality is that what's happening right now in, in Austin is something net new uh, and in mm -hmm. Texas more broadly. So Really, the, the, the political labels of the past don't apply. What is significant, though, is that um, this community is engaging with the tradition of political thought that resulted in the foundation and growth of the American Republic. Um, mm -hmm. And so 
classical liberalism is a part of that, but so is socialist thought, you know, so Mm -hmm. is, um, you know, (laughs) anarcho-capitalism. So is like uh, a whole broad set of political orientations um, who typically talk past each other or only, you know, within their kind of communal bubbles. Um, Mm -hmm. And what I'm suggesting is that it's time to get out of your bubble. Like it's time to actually do the work. (laughs) How does this fit into academic circles? Because it doesn't seem that there's obviously academics on the board and there'd be academics Mm -hmm. writing for this. And I'm sure there's, there's some sort of tie in somewhere perhaps, or maybe that's something on the roadmap. But I I know that just like from previous experience and talking with other academics that there's always some elbows for people who are trying to sit at the table among universities and publish out new research. And I'm wondering how you guys kind of fit in there. Yeah. So um, the great thing about uh, 501c3 is that we can easily uh, partner or offer grants to other 501c3s, including universities, research institutes, uh, think tanks, and other organizations that do research on this topic. Um, so you know, we, ca- we can apply for grants together. We can issue grants together. We can uh, collaborate on net new research um, with any university uh, department or or scholar who wants wants to work with us, and so we're now actually in the process of reaching out to some of the leading thinkers who have described this you know moment in uh, political economy where uh, we're kind of undergoing a state change you know from one organizational set of principles to another to help us describe that and and then to understand how the Bitcoin intervention um, can serve as a kind of platform um, to refound a political economy in the 21st century. Okay, kind of turning to a different part of the conversation and reflecting more on the past of Bitcoin foundations and Bitcoin advocacy groups, it's been a lot of hit and miss. And yeah. I, I think it would be a miss on this show if we didn't address it in some form or fashion is how many groups have tried to advocate on behalf of Bitcoin and definitely miss the mark. And luckily, yeah. Bitcoin doesn't seem to care too much. But it yeah. is important for people to kind of understand how these things fit into the scope of advocacy work. So the backdrop for those who don't know is the Bitcoin Foundation was, uh, I believe, is a nonprofit. I don't know exactly what the setup was at the time. But back in the early days, 2012, set up to basically defend Bitcoin after numerous s- scams and kind of headline slams also out there. Uh, but it had a rough go of things with uh, some founders on the board being arrested, some big people being resigning, some people being kicked off. And it definitely left a bad taste in the ecosystem's mouth afterwards for quite a while. People were saying, hey, why do we need a Bitcoin foundation? Bitcoin is code. It keeps operating. The only Bitcoin foundation we need is me running my node. But <laughs> since then, we've had a lot of changes, right? We've had people forming things like Coin Center, Sat Center more recently. There's all these blockchain councils all across the United States, which are are doing fantastic advocacy work. It's a blockchain association in DC. And now you guys are kind of in the mix. Uh, Definitely from this conversation, I'm hearing that you guys are going a very different direction and needed direction than those groups. But I think, again, just to get to the point of the question, be remiss if not understanding how you understand advocacy work on behalf of Bitcoin. So, I mean, let's, let's be clear. Bitcoin doesn't need the Texas Bitcoin Foundation. Um, it doesn't need, you know, any, uh, institution of, of governance to prop it up, to fund it, you know, to, to ensure that it succeeds. Um, however, uh, Bitcoin does not exist in a vacuum. It exists in a world with governments that can make the users of Bitcoin's lives miserable, um, and much, much harder. And so the, the emergence of Bitcoin-oriented policy organizations are basically to ensure that the people who are using Bitcoin are not unnecessarily punished or targeted by the state. Um, the purpose of the Texas Bitcoin Foundation um, is to ensure that we have the right assumptions and priors that we are bringing into our public debates about Bitcoin. Um, so one of the things that has just frustrated me to no end over the past few years is the kind of garbage that's written about Bitcoin um, in mm. the mainstream media and and by you know by smart people who who really should know better um, but are not you know taking the time 
to to do the work, you know, to to do a modicum of research on mm-hmm. you know the topics they're they're discussing, um, and and you know the policy oriented organizations can can be kind of the go to source of truth for for policy, but you know when it comes to things like political philosophy, like there was just recently an article that you know tried to paint Bitcoin and all of crypto, uh, but especially Bitcoin as some type of anarcho-capitalist project that wants to abolish the state. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, there might be some people with that point of view in in the community, but that's actually quite a minority point of view. Um, and the value that Bitcoin provides is not that it's an anarcho-capitalist project. Um, mm-hmm. And so having you know better thinking, <laughs> better scholarship, um, better descriptions of what Bitcoin is and why it matters socially is, I think, critical to ensuring that we don't create a bunch of unnecessary, you know, political drama and, and fights that distract from the mission. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, just to try and attempt to complement what you're saying there, I think we've kind of seen that recently with a lot of the uh, politicians jumping into the ring, whether that be Ted Cruz yeah. on one side being very pro Bitcoin, or we've seen Josh Mandel kind of jump in. He's uh, running for states or for the Senate in Ohio, I believe, and he's very pro Bitcoin. And then we see some people on the other side of the issue who are a little bit more socialist or left leaning, but they're also pro Bitcoin. Uh, yeah. I forget who's running against um, Brad Sherman in, in Southern California, but she definitely kind of fits Erica that left leaning. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Erica yeah. Rhodes. She's, she's more left leaning. And I think you're totally spot on there. A lot of people kind of paint Bitcoin as broad brush, anarcho-capitalist, and then kind of leave the conversation there. And it's necessary for the conversation to kind of develop from there. Uh, Last question for you, where can people find your writing and where can people look forward to the stuff you guys are going to publish from the Texas Bitcoin Foundation? So uh, txbitcoinfoundation.org is our website. You can find... Uh, links to our programming there. Um, you can also donate in both USD and Bitcoin. Um, so we just launched, um, we we have a fundraising push uh, where we're trying to get to our first $100,000 by the end of this quarter. Um, and that is going to underpin a lot of the ed- educational work that we're doing. So we are already in conversations with major major school district in Texas about adding a Bitcoin focused curriculum at the K through 12 level. Um, with a major um, vocational college with branches all over the the state about creating uh, professional certification for Bitcoin mining uh, technicians and engineers. Um, and so our goal is is really the education um, piece of this and ensuring that we're nurturing local talent um, to take the Bitcoin project to the next level. Awesome. Well, for everyone at Compass, I want to thank you for joining us on today's show. Uh, really interesting stuff going down in Austin. And we'll have to have you in the office once it's fully built out. But thanks to everyone for listening today and be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps other Bitcoin miners like yourself find this content and learn along with the rest of us. But for all of us at Compass, thanks again. Thank you so much for having me.